Terence Howard claims that this 1926 periodic chart is better than the periodic table that science has developed. I'm going to show you why he's wrong with science and some cool experiments. I asked, I told the teacher, um, and he was like, no, each element is the same element and it will always be that element. And I was like, you don't see the relationship. The relationship between hydrogen on the spectrometer and carbon and silicon. This is silicon and this is silicon. Very different. Please continue. And cobalt, and I was like, it's the same exact color, same tone, just doubled. That's a lot to digest. Let's start with what is a spectrometer. A spectrometer adds fuel to your test sample and creates a flame that releases atoms of the sample. A special lamp directs these atoms through a slit to focus it and then divide the light into individual wavelengths that can be easily viewed on a detector. If we do this for hydrogen gas, the simplest element, it will generate these four lines every time. Each color represents a specific wavelength of light. Every element has their spectral line signature. If you're curious why these lines happen, stick around to the end. The answer sparked a new branch of science. Back to Terence. The relationship between hydrogen on the spectrometer and carbon and silicon and cobalt, and I was like, it's the same exact colors. Here's the spectrometer signatures for each of those four elements. Same color? There's not even the same number of colors. And it was like it's the same exact color, same tone, just doubled. The four wavelengths of hydrogen have four corresponding frequencies. Carbon, silicon, and cobalt have dozens of frequencies. How are these the same? Same tone? Let's start with hydrogen. These are the four frequencies of hydrogen and turn color back into sound, you keep dividing light by two, and you'll ultimately get back to the audible sound of it. Light and sound, that reminds me to remind you to subscribe and turn on notifications. It really helps, thank you. Visible light has a range of 400 to 790 terahertz. Audible sound for humans is at best 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. This is a two times range for light, but 1,000 times for sound. If we divide the maximum light frequency by two, as Terence suggests, we would need to divide 38 times to get in the audio range, specifically 2,874 hertz or around F7, the seventh F key on the piano. And for the lower light frequency, this becomes 1,455 hertz for sound. Here's the problem, that's only one octave hydrogen and carbon and silicon and cobalt and it was like it's the same exact color same tone just doubled in each octave but we just showed that because the range of visible light is only a factor of two you can only have one octave like hydrogen to carbon all the other octaves are not possible and this is a key structural point in walter russell's periodic chart the first thing that we're able to perceive is hydrogen. That's the first visible element because before it is too dense for us to perceive it. Can't perceive it? What's the point of all these invisible elements? If you can't detect a phenomenon, it has no business in science. How do you know it's too dense if you can't perceive it? Without measurement, there is no science. And what they've tried to keep from us, if you have, you want to break water into its component parts of hydrogen and oxygen, all you have to do is introduce beryllium or the sound of beryllium. And, and oxygen will violently break away from any other thing, even hydrogen. Creating hydrogen and oxygen with a tone, that would be amazing. Too bad Terence is not sharing the secret beryllium frequency. But he has given us something to test. Let's try it. Here's a beaker of water, a piece of beryllium. Hmm, don't see anything violently happening here. That was disappointing. But let's do the real thing, breaking water into its component parts. For electrolysis, we need a container of distilled water, two test tubes also filled with water, 
two carbon electrodes, and an electric current. The bubbles that we see here are hydrogen and oxygen. But how do we know it's really hydrogen? Let's test it. Hydrogen is flammable, right? Cool. Those other little elements, titanium, vanadium, chromium, manganese, magnese, and... It's pronounced manganese. If you're going to invent a new periodic table, it would be useful to learn to pronounce all the elements first. Please continue and iron, all of those, those aren't true elements, those are isotopes. No, just no. Of course titanium and iron are elements. Little? They're all at least four times the mass of carbon. Little on the periodic chart doesn't count. Before I can explain why these are not isotopes, I need to fill you in on the basics that is the genius of the Mendeleev periodic table. Let's start with hydrogen. In 1808, John Dalton proposed the idea of atoms, the Lego blocks of all matter. Rocks, trees, birds, and us are all made of atoms. After a hundred years of research, experimenting, and science, Niels Bohr peeked inside an atom to find that the hydrogen atom contained two parts. A positive charged particle in the center that he named the proton, and a negative tiny particle orbiting around it called the electron. Element number two is helium. The element number tells you how many electrons and protons it has. So helium has two each. But you'll notice that it has an atomic weight of four. So if the protons contribute two units of weight and the electron is minuscule, where is the rest of the weight? It's in a new particle also in the nucleus called a neutron. Helium has one more electron in the same orbit as hydrogen, so we place it to the right of hydrogen. Helium is the first of the noble gases and is chemically inert. Element number three is lithium. Three electrons, three protons, and four neutrons. A new shell is created for lithium because two electrons completes the small first shell. Lithium is placed under hydrogen in the periodic table because it has similar affinity for bonding with other atoms like hydrogen. Next up is beryllium with four pairs of electrons and protons. Unlike helium, this shell needs eight electrons to be complete. These will be filled in by the next six elements. Beryllium behaves like lithium, but not as strongly, so it belongs next to it. But it's nothing like helium, so helium shifts to the right. Boron belongs next to beryllium and causes helium to shift again, followed by carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and neon. Neon completes the second shell, so it too is a noble gas. It belongs under helium in the eighth column. That means they don't chemically react with anything. That's why helium balloons are so much safer than hydrogen ones. By the way, the columns are more commonly called groups and the rows are referred to as periods. That's where the name periodic table comes from. The next period adds a third shell of eight places for electrons, one for each added element. The key is the number of electrons in the outer shell. That's why elements in the same group behave similarly. With additional electron shells, more rows are introduced to the periodic table. The transition metals, including the four that Terence referenced, belong after the second group for periods four to seven. And finally, in the open slot shown here, the 30 radioactive elements are inserted. That's it, that's the whole periodic table. And iron, all of those, those aren't true elements, those are isotopes. So we showed that these are indeed elements, but if they're not isotopes, what, what are isotopes? Let's have another look at carbon. It has six electrons, six protons, and six neutrons. Remember, the number of neutrons is the atomic weight minus the atomic number. This atom is also called carbon-12 because it has a weight of 12. But there's another variation of this atom called carbon-13. It has the same chemical properties as carbon-12, but different physical ones, most notably a weight of 13 due to an extra neutron. And even another version called carbon-14, sound familiar? It's used to determine the age of ancient organic matter like bones, carbon dating. These three variations are called isotopes. On Earth, 99% of carbon is C12, 1% is carbon-13, with only trace amounts of carbon-14. They're all carbon, but weigh slightly different. 
Let's see what else Terence has to say about the periodic table. We know the relationship between sodium and chlorine. They're equal and opposite mates. If you get out of the pool and you got chlorine and you're itching from the chlorine, all you have to do is get some real salt and rub that on your skin and it'll turn right into an oil. Okay, let's try it. I don't have a pool, so I'll need to improvise. Chlorine tablet. This is kind of itchy. Terrence is right there. Hmm, don't feel any oil. Let's look at this chemically. Here's the periodic table with sodium on the far left and chlorine on the right. And here's their outer atomic shells. These two definitely fit together. Remember, the outer shells of the elements want to be complete. Usually that's eight electrons. Sodium has only one and chlorine is missing one. And what is NaCl? Table solved. So Terence is suggesting to add more chlorine to your skin that's already irritated by a chlorine compound to make oil and relieve your itching? The problem is, all oils are organic compounds, which means they contain hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon. There is no carbon here, so it can't turn into an oil. Forming salt from sodium and chlorine gas is very cool. It needs chlorine gas, so I'm not doing it, but here it is done by Mr. Grodsky's chemistry. The white smoke you see is salt in a gaseous form. Terence calls sodium and chlorine mates. Mate usually means you're one and only. Here's some of the relationship these two elements can have. Lots of partners. This is the molecules or compounds that they can form. And the Mendeleev periodic table allows scientists, chemists, and chemical engineers to formulate new compounds because of how it's structured. We usually think of sodium as a white powder. But the pure sodium element is a metal, silver and shiny like this. And because it's in the first group of the periodic table, it's a very active element with only one electron in its outer shell. The sodium atoms keep dumping their outer electrons so energetically that they burst into flame as the sample disintegrates in a spectacular explosion. Here's how it works. Sodium added to water produces sodium hydroxide or lye that's the milky residue in the water, and hydrogen gas. Okay, Terrence, what's next? But they feel that carbon will always be carbon, and they don't understand that it unwinds and becomes nitrogen. Nitrogen unwinds and becomes oxygen. You don't feel that carbon won't change. We know it doesn't because we can see it. It's fine to have a theory, but where is the evidence? Examples? Demonstrations. Maybe there is evidence of this unwinding. Let's use this example of carbon. Barbecued charcoal is carbon. So are diamonds. Have you ever seen either of these turn into nitrogen, the next element in the periodic table? And nitrogen is a gas at room temperature, so effectively, they would disappear. Have you ever been in a room where all the oxygen turned into fluorine? Hmm, probably not, because fluorine is a toxic gas at room temperature. Oh, I've got it. Five cent coins are made mostly of the element nickel. Have you ever seen it unwind to look like a penny that's made of copper? Oh, but then maybe it unwinds to zinc or gallium, germanium, arsenic, selenium, bromine, which is another deadly gas. After billions of years since the elements were created, why haven't all the elements been unwound into the biggest ones? Today, 92% of all atoms in the universe are still hydrogen, the simplest element. But how are the elements formed in the first place? It's the stars. Stars are initially balls of hydrogen that under their massive gravity exert enormous pressure that fuses hydrogen into helium. Once all the helium is used up, about 10 million years, the star combines these to make the heavier elements. Our sun can produce lithium, beryllium, and boron by fusing helium. Bigger stars are needed to produce all the other elements. The elements were formed by nuclear processes, not chemical ones. Here's an amazing thought. Atoms in your left hand probably came from a different star than your right hand because 200 million stars have exploded to make up the atoms in your body. Back on Earth, with the exception of radioactive elements, the atoms in the periodic table do not change. Just like Terence's chemistry professor told him so many years ago. 
And he was like, no, each element is the same element and it will always be that element. It's good to question the world around us. That's where new ideas come from. But check multiple credible sources before reaching a decision. Thanks for sticking around until the end. Now for the bonus material. Let's figure out where those spectrometer lines come from that convince Terence hydrogen, carbon, silicon all have the same tone. Here's the proton and electron of a hydrogen atom. When the electron is excited by the flame in the spectrometer, it jumps to a higher orbit. But this is not a stable location, so the electron won't be here for long. It will jump back to the original orbit. And in the process, it dumps its extra energy as a photon, light. If the flame heats up the electron a little more, it can jump to an even higher orbit. And when it drops back, it will emit light with more energy, a higher frequency. And we see this as a different color. In 1913, Niels Bohr discovered that the electron could only jump to specific energy level orbits, quanta. For hydrogen, in the visible light range, there are exactly four electron jumps possible. And the specific colors matching these jumps are red, cyan, blue, and violet, the four spectral lines of hydrogen. And here's a cool application of this fact. When astronomers point a spectrometer at a star and see this spectral line signature, they know it contains hydrogen. Hydrogen is the simplest element with only one electron. When we look at the other elements with many electrons, the combination of energy transition increases dramatically, which generates a lot more spectral lines. What new branch of science did this discovery create? Quantum physics! Mendeleev did not come up with the periodic table by himself. It reflects over 200 years of growth in the understanding of the chemical and physical properties of the elements, with contributions by many scientists. Science is not about the fame, money, or likes. It's about the knowledge discovered and passed on. Want to know more about the four giants of science? Click here.